Hey, uh, Cryptozins. Tonight's show is Do Kwan on the run, proof of work Ethereum updates, and SEC versus XRP news. It's 10 p.m. Pacific time. The date is September 18th, 2022. And welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter. My name is Nicodemus, and I'll be your host. The cover model, mascot, and co host for this podcast is Tex. And together, We take a nightly look at the crypto, NFT, and metaverse space and the industry that surrounds it. Now, if you have questions or comments on the show, come find us on Twitter or email us at nick at cryptoovernighter.com. And keep in mind, nothing in this show should ever be considered financial advice. So, despite the fact that Do Kwan has an arrest warrant issued against him, Do Kwan claims that he's working with authorities. He claims he's not, quote, on the run. And we really don't know where he is. Yeah, that's right. Kind of like the Three Arrow Capital guys, Kyle Davies and Suzu, Do Kwan is in the wind. Based on a Reuters report, the Singapore police force said that Kwan isn't there. It was believed that he was holed up in Singapore. So months after investors lost $42 billion, and it's my belief that Terra Luna's Black Swan event took down Three Arrows Capital, Celsius, Voyager, and others. So months after all of this, and South Korea finally gets around to issuing an arrest warrant, and now nobody can find the guy. As a response to all that, the Seoul's prosecutor's office said that they would be working with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They want to nullify the passports of Do Kwan and five other project members. They're also going to get with Interpol and escalate the South Korean arrest warrant into an international arrest warrant. So despite what the Singapore police force says, many people that Kwan and those five project managers, they believe that they're in Singapore still. And Singapore currently doesn't have an extradition treaty with South Korea. And so since Luna crashed and Terra's stablecoin depegged, police have raided 15 points of locations in connection with the case. This includes crypto exchanges and corporate offices alike. Those raids were in connection with allegations that Kwan and others from Terraform Labs violated South Korea's Capital Markets Act. And it sounds like they have the same problem that we do in the U.S. There's a disagreement over what should be covered by the Securities Exchange Commission. In this case, prosecutors are making the case that Luna tokens were investment security contracts. So that means that they consider Kwan's actions of continuing to issue those tokens, both Luna and the stablecoin, all without notifying investors of the risks. They're calling that fraud. And I can see how they get there from their point of view. They used Kwan's own words against him. He said, quote, if I deposit Terra into their form labs, I will pay an interest rate of 19.4%. They're calling statements like this evidence that Quan knew investments in the ecosystem were unsustainable, and yet still he continued to promote Luna. Despite all this, despite the arrest warrant, despite the fact that his passport might end up voided, despite the fact that the Singapore police are coming to the city looking for him, Do Kwan insists he's not on the run. On Saturday afternoon, he took to Twitter. He started off this tweet thread by telling crypto Twitter, quote, Dear CT, I will tell you what I'm doing and where I am if, one, we are friends, two, we have plans to meet, three, we are involved in a GPS-based Web3 game. Otherwise, you have no business knowing my GPS coordinates. Which is a heck of a way to start. And then he went on to say, quote, I am not on the run or anything similar. For any government agency that has shown interest to communicate, we are in full cooperation and don't have anything to hide. We are in the process of defending ourselves in multiple jurisdictions. We have held ourselves to an extremely high bar of integrity and look forward to clarifying the truth over the next few months. So it seems to me that he's on the run. And if so, he's not likely to come hide in the United States he'll probably receive no warmer reception. The SEC is looking into him here as well. This has been ongoing for a while, but the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission is looking into whether Terraform Labs 
broke federal investor protection laws in the way that they promoted their stablecoin. At the time of writing, the global crypto market cap is $935 billion. That's down 3.88%. The top five cryptos by market cap are Bitcoin down 2.9%, Ethereum down 7.55%. That post-merge dump is starting to get ugly. Tether, USDC, and Binance Coin down 3.54%. So when last we checked in on Ethereum, the merge had successfully completed, and despite that success, the price has tanked steadily. We also talked about a variant of Ethereum. that This is a proof-of-work variation of Ethereum that is not Ethereum Classic. Now, at the time, we were talking about FTX. And while FTX was tracking the price of a proof-of-work Ethereum fork, there wasn't really much to recommend it. In the run-up to the merge... Ethereum POW pumped, but that proved to be a short-lived rally. Because while the price had reached a high of just over 60 bucks each, shortly after the merge, it dropped to the $10 range. So, let's take a look. As we like to do on the show, let's take a look at the numbers. At the time of writing, FPOW is trading at $4.42 each. That's no calculated market cap. But there is a 24-hour total volume of $127 million. That's up 7.62%. Which is surprising, frankly, because there have been issues from the very beginning. Because just hours after the merge completed and Ethereum successfully transitioned to a proof-of-stake blockchain, that's when FPOW came to life. And this was supposed to be their moment. Ethereum had merged. The hard fork launching their mainnet was supposed to be a moment of triumph. Instead, it quickly descended into madness. Now, right away, there were errors. Their servers were down at times. People had problems getting hooked up with MetaMask. And they found out that part of their problem came from their chain ID. Chain IDs were created the last time Ethereum forked into Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. They provide a mechanism to identify a specific network. Also, it helps blockchains confirm the unique identity of on-chain assets. So, yeah, instead of making sure that everything was in place, they just assumed it was going to be okay when, in fact, it was not. Because there is no central authority to register chain IDs. They can be just chosen arbitrarily. In fact, it are. And what happened is that the FPOW team chose the same chain ID as a Bitcoin Cash testnet. If they'd engaged in just a little pre-fork testing, they would have caught this. Which is funny, because this isn't some obscure thing. They were talking about chain IDs extensively. The concern arose that users could become victims of a replay attack if FPOW did not change their network ID away from the chain ID that the Ethereum mainnet uses. Now, all of this does nothing to help their reputation online. Because while some users said that the network was working just fine, others pointed out the confusion that marred the blockchain's launch. And again, as always, the bad guys were out in force. Because you know what happens if you're on Twitter and you even mention MetaMask. You know, the bots come crawling out of the woodwork. Well, the same thing is happening now. Scammers are posing that they work for MetaMask, and then they volunteer to, quote, help with their chain ID issues. But there is an alternative, one that's been around longer than FPOW. Because before FPOW, there was Ethereum Fair still has a proof-of-work consensus model, and their Twitter account has been around since January of 2020. They are led by a group of Chinese miners. In fact, their core documentation is written in Chinese. Despite being over two years old, they have only now started focusing on creating telegram groups for different languages. At present, Ethereum Fair is trading at $5.24, so a bit more than Ethereum POW. That said, the 24-hour volume is way, way down by comparison. Less than $7 million in the last 24 hours. 
and Ethereum Fair has support. Poloniex announced that it would be supporting Ethereum Fair, quote, based on the market situation, consensus of users, and the community. They're also supporting Ethereum W2. But if you are a Poloniex user, you don't pay fees if you use Tron's USDD stablecoin to pay for it. Ethereum Fair is also traded on Huobi and Bitcoke. The global NFT market cap is up 1.8%. Sales volume is down 7.31%. According to CoinMarketCap, the top five NFT collections by sales volume are Bored Apes, followed by Mutant Apes, Other Deed, Clonex, and Doodles. Now keep in mind, some of these collections have very volatile prices. So, do your own research. I think Ripple Labs and the U.S. Securities Exchange Commission, I think they're just done. They both want a federal judge to issue a ruling already. That either Ripple Labs and their XRP token violated securities laws or dismiss the lawsuit without a lengthy trial. Both parties have filed motions for summary judgment in the Southern District of New York. And so they're asking the district judge, Annalisa Torres, to make a ruling based on arguments filed in accompanying documents. These documents were posted to a federal database on Friday. As a quick refresher, the SEC sued Ripple Labs in December of 2020. They sued Ripple Labs, CEO Brad Garlinghouse, and Chairman Chris Larson. They were alleging that Ripple raised over $1.3 billion by selling the token in unregistered securities transactions. Now, from Ripple's side, they're saying that they didn't do anything wrong, that selling and trading XRP fails to meet the standards set in the Howey test. This case has been dragging on for two years, but not much has happened. They've been filing discovery motions, but they really haven't tried the case. Other than the Hinman document. Now, if they were scoring points, they'd have to give that Hinman document one to Ripple. William Hinman's 2018 speech affirmed the conclusion that the cryptocurrency XRP was not a security. Now, from the SEC's point of view, they're arguing that various statements put out by Ripple executives show that Ripple sold XRP and that people bought XRP because they believed the value would go up over time. In their filing, they said, quote, Ripple publicly touted the various steps it was taking and would take to find a use for XRP and to protect the integrity and liquidity of the XRP markets. Now, Ripple's argument is simple. There was no contract drawn up between the company and XRP investors. And further, there was no common enterprise. Common enterprise being one of the important aspects of a security under the Howey test. They rightly point out that people buying coins on an exchange have no idea who they're actually buying them from. In Ripple's filing, they said, quote, Even if the SEC were to engage in a belated post-discovery transaction-by-transaction analysis to identify XRP offers and sales with contracts, its claim would still fail as a matter of law. Not one of those contracts granted post-sale rights to recipients as against Ripple or imposed post-sale obligations on Ripple to act for the benefit of those recipients. So these filings for summary judgment means that they're asking the court to determine whether either side has proven one way or another that there either was or was not a violation. It's going to be interesting to see which way the judge responds. And I think that's going to do it for us tonight. Uh, We had a great weekend. I hope you guys did too. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. Take care of yourselves, but take care of each other too. We'll see you tomorrow night. 